And so our text for this afternoon, we'll just read that again for a moment. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Let's pray for God's blessing upon our time together in his word. Father, we give you thanks for your word, and we pray that as we look at it together, you would help us to understand what it means that we have been created in the image of you, the almighty God. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what is a human? If you look to the dictionary to get an answer to that question, you'll be told that A human is a member of the animal family that is most advanced on the evolutionary development scale. We're mammals that walk around on two feet, and we have bigger brains than any other animal that enable us to think and talk. But if you go to the Bible, you're going to find a very different description. The sixth day of creation in the Bible, is a very special day because not only is it the last day of creation, it's also the day in which God created the crown of his creation, namely people. And there are a few things in the Genesis account that indicate to us how humans are the most unique of all the creatures God created. First of all, you look at the sheer number of words that the author of Genesis devotes to the creation of people. He uses six verses to describe the creation of all the animals, whether they're ones that swim or slither or fly or walk. But then to describe the creation of a mere two people, he uses the same number of verses and then adds to that an entire other chapter, Genesis chapter 2. So the number of words shows us how important man is, but also the way God made people shows us they are unique among creatures. When God created people, there was a divine conference held. It was like there was this pause before he engages in this culminating act of creation. When God created all the lights, the land, the water, the animals, he just said, let there be, and it was so. But in this final act of creation, we read in Genesis 1.26, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. You see, there's this conference happening between the three persons of the triune God, and this alerts us to the fact that there's something special going on now. There's also not only the divine conference between the three persons of the Trinity, there's the divine nearness of God. When he creates everything else, he just speaks from a distance. Let there be, and it was so. But when he creates Adam and Eve, he draws near. He takes dust from the ground and forms and fashions it. You get this picture of a potter working with clay, this close, intimate connection. And if that's not intimate enough, we read he breathes into this form, this dust, the breath of life. There's divine nearness, and then there's divine speech. Throughout those six days of creation, God does a lot of talking, talks everything into existence. But with the sixth day of creation and the final act of creation, he doesn't just speak to Adam and Eve. He speaks with these creatures, speaks to them and with them. And this shows the uniquely personal relationship God has with these creatures, something no other creatures enjoy in their connection with God. So the creation of people marks the culmination of God's creative work. It's often said that people are the crown of God's creation, and that's a very fitting way to speak about it, because a crown is the most important piece of regalia that adorns a monarch. In the same way, humans are the crown of God's creation, the most important creatures to crown his creation. And the crown is also a symbol of a king and queen's power to rule. And so God gave to Adam and Eve, the first king and queen, the power to rule over all his creation and all the creatures within it. So here in Genesis 1.27, we have a twofold answer to the question, what is a human? 
what are these highest of created beings? And we want to look this afternoon at how God created people in his image. That's the first thing that's important about what it means to be a human. We're created in God's image. And in our first point, we're going to look at what that means that we are created in God's image. And in our second point, why that matters, why that's so important. So first of all, what does it mean that we're created in the image of God? Well, in verse 26 of chapter 1, we find a synonym in the parallel phrases there that gives us a clue about imaging God and what that means. Let us make man in our image, God said, according to our likeness. So image and likeness are synonyms. To be made in the image of God, in other words, is to be made like God in certain ways. You could say the pattern God used when he was creating people was himself. And that's a remarkable thing to say. But in what ways are we like God? Well, let's begin by ruling out ways in which we are not like God. We are not as powerful as God. God says through the prophet Isaiah, to whom will you compare me or who is my equal? And it's a rhetorical question which demands the answer, no one is God's equal. We also don't know as much as God, so it's not in our knowledge. We read Psalm 139, the psalmist confesses, O Lord, you know when I sit down and when I rise up, you know my thoughts, you know the word before it is on my tongue. God knows everything we know but a wee little. And the little bit that knowledge that we do acquire throughout life often just serves to show us how much more we don't know and yet need to learn. So we're not as powerful as God. We don't know as much as God. We're also not omnipresent like God. First Kings 18, Solomon built that temple. First Kings 8, sorry, Solomon built the tabernacle um, and confessed, will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heaven, cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. He knew that God is everywhere and that he cannot be contained by any building or any country. And we certainly can't be either. Maybe mentally we can be in more than one place at once, but not physically. So we are not omnipresent like God. We also don't look like God. Now maybe that goes without saying But amid all the COVID-related restrictions that we've faced in the past years, one of the misguided arguments against the wearing of masks was made by some lawmakers in the United States and perhaps elsewhere, but they said, I quote, we are created in the image and likeness of God. That image is seen the most by our face. I will not wear a mask. That's the image of God right there. Well, that's flat out not true. What does Jesus say to the Samaritan woman that he meets at the well? God is spirit. In other words, God is invisible. He doesn't have a physical form. Yes, Jesus takes on a form, but the God, his essence is spirit. John 1, 18, no one has ever seen God. So it's not a matter of looks that make us image God. What then does it mean that we are made in the image of God? How do we image him? It's not our outward appearance, but it's ultimately got to do with our inward nature. We are spiritual beings who have a soul, and that is at the heart of what it means to image God, that we are image bearers created like him. Genesis 2 verse 7 says, tells us two things about the constitution of people. It says we were made from the dust of the earth. In other words, we're living, breathing, physical beings with flesh and blood and bones that can move about, be seen, heard, and touched. And in these ways, we're just like the animals. But Genesis 2 verse 7 also says something else about the creation of man that it does not say about the creation of animals. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. God himself who is spirit breathed into Adam and gave to him a spirit or a soul making him 
like God in that Adam has this spiritual, this immaterial, eternal component to him. Jesus speaks about this in Matthew 10, 28, when he says, do not fear those who kill the body, because that's all they can kill. Do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So it's our soul or our spirit that makes us stand out as unique among all other creatures. And what are the implications of the fact that we are spiritual beings or souled beings? Well, it means we are categorically different from animals in many ways. Animals cannot think. Oh, they can express emotions. Those of us who have pets know they can do that on their own animal level. They can show loyalty. But they are not rational beings. You're not going to get your pets to add or subtract or do computer coding. And you're not going to get your pets to come up with a name for themselves. You need to do the thinking to give them a name. Animals, of course, operate on instinct. And that's a marvelous thing that God's given them. You think of the beaver and their instinct to build dams. Or bees who know to build their hives in this hexagonal shape so it doesn't get crushed by the weight of all the honey. God has programmed animals to do these marvelous things. But they cannot program themselves or anything else to do anything. Animals can't think, but we can. Animals also cannot talk like we can. Oh, they can communicate at various levels. They have a lot of different mannerisms they can use to communicate. And you can say parrots can talk. Yes, they can, but they can only parrot. They can't think and give intelligible speech. Speech is something unique to human beings that sets us apart from all the other animals. And furthermore, we are distinct from the animals in that animals are not morally responsible creatures. When God created the animals, he didn't give them any commandments, none at all. But he did give them instinct. And that means animals are not morally responsible beings They have no concept of true and false, right and wrong, good and evil. They just do what they were coded by God to do. But to Adam and Eve, to these people, he did give them a law because they are moral beings. And the first command is given in Genesis 2.16. The Lord God commanded them saying, of all the trees in the garden you may freely eat, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you shall surely die. It was to humans and humans alone that God gave a command. Either obey me and live, or disobey me and die. But no such choice is given to the animals, because they are not morally responsible creatures. And it might sound so obvious... If you want proof, just walk into a courtroom and see if you're ever going to find an animal being hauled into a courtroom to be charged with a crime. Maybe your neighbor's dog bit you. What is your lawyer going to do if you try to take your neighbor's dog into court? Well, the lawyer might say, how much money do you think you're going to get from a dog? Or do you need to visit a psych ward? We don't do this. They're not morally responsible creatures. You can take the dog's owner to court, but not the animal itself. So God made us moral and spiritual beings who make choices. We do know the difference between right and wrong and have the freedom to choose between those two options. And God's law is a reflection of God's character and we image God or are living like God wants us to live and reflecting him and his heart when we live according to his law. And God expects us to. We're morally responsible to do so. And before the fall into sin, Adam and Eve had the ability to always make the right choices. Belgic Confession Article 14 says this, We believe that God created man from the dust of the earth and made and formed him in his image and likeness, good, just, and holy able by his own will to conform in all things to the will of God. 
Or consider Ecclesiastes 7, 29. Truly this only I have found, that God made man upright. Adam and Eve were able to obey God and resist temptation. But with the fall, what happened? We lost this ability to obey God. Canons of Dort, we confess, rebelling against God at the instigation of the devil and by his own free will, man deprived himself of all these outstanding gifts and brought upon himself blindness, terrible darkness, futility, distortion of judgment in his mind, perversity, defiance, hardness of heart and will, and finally, impurity in all his emotions. And from then on, after Adam and Eve fell into sin, the offspring, all the offspring of the human race have been infected with this spiritual deformity, this sin DNA that corrupts our heart. Genesis 5 verse 3 tells us that Adam has children who bear not only the image of the good God who created man, but also the image of their fallen father, Adam. And if you read the second half of Ecclesiastes 7.29, we read, it says not only that God made man upright, but since the fall, they have sought out many schemes. God created man perfect, and by Noah's day, what's the assessment God makes of the state of humanity? Genesis 6 verse 5 the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. What a terrible state we are in. So the fact that we're spiritual beings means we can think, we can talk, and we're morally responsible for how we think, feel, talk, and act. And there's one final thing we haven't mentioned, which we'll look at more at length as we conclude the sermon, but the fact that we are image bearers of God and have this spiritual nature means we are eternal or immortal creatures. Yes, we have a body that will die, but we have souls that will live forever and, upon the resurrection, bodies that will be joined with our souls and dwell forever for all eternity as well. But let's consider now, what's the big deal about the fact that we're made in God's image? I mean, does it really matter whether or not we believe we are categorically distinct creatures or whether we are essentially just apes um, are our ancestors and we are just further developed in our cognitive abilities? Does it really matter? Yes, it does. And in our second point, we want to consider why it matters, both for this life and also in the life to come. If people believe they are just animals who happen to be a little further developed than apes, whose image, presumably, we might bear, then we have no basis for this beloved thing that Western culture calls human rights. If we are just the result of random biological processes with no God-given purpose, if we are fundamentally no different than apes or the ants that we trod on, then why should any individual human life matter more than another creature's life? I mean, we trap critters that bother us. Why don't we trap pesky people who bother us and treat them in the same way? The world has no answer, no good answer to that question. No reason to believe we are fundamentally different than animals on a secular worldview. If you watch that documentary, What is a Woman?, you'll see evidence of just how that is true. There are people who think they are animals. Here in Toronto, the uh, Matt Walsh interviewed a couple people, and one of them identifies, a 27-year-old girl identifies as a wolf therian from the furry fandom. And the teacher reports how there are children in her class who will meow or purr in response to questions asked, and 
the teachers are required to acknowledge that response from that child because that's a legitimate queer identity to identify as a cat. You see, that's where we head when we throw the Bible out the window. We have no reason to believe we're fundamentally different than animals, and we just might be animals. Or you will get people on exhibit behind a fence in a zoo. Yes, that has happened multiple times throughout history. Or it leads people like Klaus Schwab's key advisor to refer to humans as hackable animals whose DNA can be extracted, manipulated, and monitored. But you see, if we recognize that humans are made in the image of God, there are all kinds of implications that flow from this reality, and we refer to them often as human rights. Now, the phrase human rights is not actually a biblical phrase. You won't find it in the Bible. And yet the foundation for this concept of human rights is rooted in the reality that we are image bearers of God. More specifically, the concept of human rights is rooted in the Ten Commandments God gives us in His Word. And the Ten Commandments are not first and foremost about our rights, but about our God-given obligation to Him and our God-given obligations to each other. And that, in turn, has a bearing on what we expect from each other and how we expect to be treated by each other. Think of it for a moment. Commandment 5, honor your father and mother. This lays the foundation for the right to have authority that you bear recognized and respected. Or commandment 6, do not murder. There's the basis for the right to life. If you're alive, you've got the right to remain alive. You shall not murder. No one may take the life of another human. And... Because humans are so unique among God's creatures, the crown of his creation, made in his image, we read in Genesis 9, 6, whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made man. God makes very clear, you may never kill another human being because to do so is to snuff out the life of one who bears my image. And if someone takes the life of an image bearer of me, you must take that person's life. Think of the seventh commandment. There we have the right, the human right, you could say, to monogamous union with a spouse. Or commandment eight, do not steal. There's the right to personal property. Commandment nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. There's the right to have your reputation unmarred by slander from another. So our human rights are enshrined in the Ten Commandments, which are better understood as human responsibilities. But who has these human rights? It's a question we consider as we think of why is it so important that we understand we're made in God's image. Who has human rights? You might say, well, isn't the answer to that question embedded in the question, humans have human rights? Of course, that's true. But in a world in which we're living, which throws the Bible out the window... They don't have that answer. The world's answer is apes are simply humans at an earlier stage of development. So maybe they have human rights too. But the Bible's answer is that we are categorically different creatures. God made animals. God made humans. And only humans bear God's image. Not animals. All humans bear God's image. Therefore, all humans have human rights. Every single person who's ever lived all throughout history is a descendant of Adam and Eve and has the image of God stamped on them. So it doesn't matter what race you're from, what your skin color is, you have these human rights. The slaving, the enslaving of those from African descent is a horrible sin. The Holocaust, the slaughter of the Jews after viewing them as an inferior race is a terrible sin. All humans have human rights also, regardless of what their religion is. We talk about how Christians are persecuted throughout the world, but so are people of other religions. Think of the Uyghur Muslims, Turkish ethnicity, who are slaughtered in a genocide. All humans have human rights also, no matter what age you are. When you become older and you are not as able to get around, when your mind starts slowing down, You are just as much an image bearer of God as when you were young, and we may not take the life 
of those who are aging or ill. All humans have human rights regardless of their abilities, too. You might be dependent on others to get around, but there's no room in God's world to take the life of those with disabilities. Or what about the location in which a human being lives? You're all image bearers of God and have human rights regardless of whether you're in the womb or outside of the womb. And what a sad thing to see in the United States this push after Roe versus Wade has been overturned, this push to offer to pay travel expenses for employees to travel out of state to get abortions. Or companies who are offering free abortion benefits to mothers. What a sin in God's sight as is sex-selective abortions, for male and female both equally bear the image of God. All humans have human rights. And the second thing to note is only humans have human rights. And again, you might think that sounds absurd, but in our world today, it's something we need to talk about. Yes, animals must be treated with care. Proverbs 27 says, Verse 23 says, Be sure to know the condition of your flocks and give careful attention to your herds. Proverbs 12, 10. A righteous man cares for the needs of his animal. It's not okay to abuse animals, to neglect them, or to needlessly kill them for sport. But animals may be used for food. We're allowed to kill them to eat. Genesis 1 Uh, Genesis 9, after the floodwaters receded, God blessed Noah and his family and said, all the beasts of the earth and every creature that moves along the ground and all the fish in the sea, they will be food for you. If you want to be vegetarian or vegan, that's fine. Just don't complain if I want my steak and want to eat it too. God gives us meat to eat. And as part of good stewardship, we may use the remains of the animal to make Clothing from the fur and the leather and whatever other products, that's okay. But consider the problems that arise when you think that humans are just basically animals further advanced and that there's no categorical difference. You get the absurdity of the animal rights movements. Maybe you've heard of the Mercy for Animals group, a Canadian animal rights group that illegally entered a pig barn in B.C., took a video of a farmer taking a handgun to kill a sick pig and then posting it online saying, look at the cruelty to animals and putting these viewer discretion warnings out there because of the graphic content of the video. How absurd. We can go play video games in which we slaughter people and cut them apart with chainsaws and slay them with bullets and have blood, guts, and gore all across the screen, but to take a pig out of its misery is a horrific deed? No. Or think of PETA, the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, an international organization. They write, the president writes, instead of seeing all the other species on earth as ours to convert into hamburgers, handbags, living burglar alarms, and so on, we need to respect these animals as fellow beings as other individuals and families and tribes who have the same basic interests in experiencing joy and love and living as we do. That's what happens when you don't realize that humans and humans alone are created in the image of God. Or you get this push for plant-based meat substitutes, or more recently, government-subsidized cricket farms so that we can stop killing animals in the future and eat cricket protein instead of meat. If we don't recognize people are created in the image of God, we start treating animals like people and extending human rights to animals. But back to the question, who has human rights If we are fundamentally no different than apes and other animals, why limit human rights to humans? There's this explicit push back in 2007 in New York where the New York courts were asked to grant chimpanzees the status of legal personhood to ensure they receive better treatment. Again, think of the absurdity when we leave the Christian worldview. Chimpanzees with human rights, are they going to pay taxes and pay for care? This is where the absurdity goes. 
and even mainline churches who buy into the evolutionary theory which sees humans as essentially animals start compromising in key ways and offering funeral services, divine worship services for their animal upon death. You see, the fact that we are created in the image of God has great implications for how we live. It determines what kind of creatures have human rights, whether or not all humans have human rights, but it also is very important in terms of what it means for us in the next life. The fact that we are image bearers of God and spiritual beings means, we said, that we are morally responsible beings. We are accountable to God for how we think, how we talk, how we live. And the fact that we are spiritual beings means we have souls that are eternal, which will be united with bodies that will be eternal upon the resurrection. You see, animals die and turn into dust, and that's the end of them. I had a friend ask me, a non-Christian friend, is there justice for animals on the day of judgment? He said, you might have an animal that injures or kills someone during his lifetime. Think of an animal that gores another person and kills it. Is there justice for this animal? The Christian worldview says, no, you kill that animal because it's endangering people's lives and that's the end of justice for that animal. It won't be raised in the judgment and judged by God. But people will be. We are morally responsible beings. God has put eternity in our hearts. And when Jesus comes again, the bodies of both believers and unbelievers will be raised and reunited with our souls and we will be summoned into the divine courtroom. And every person will be judged according to their works. Remember we said the law of God reflects who God is and we need to live in a way that reflects God. We are morally responsible. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, writes the Apostle Paul, that we might receive the things done in the body according to what we have done, whether good or bad. All people will be held accountable and for all our actions. Jesus says, but I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. Well, it's bad news if we consider the fact that we don't obey God's law as we ought to. We don't image him or live like him, and we are morally responsible to do so. Our level of obedience to the law is precisely a measure of how much we reflect God's image. And he requires perfect obedience. Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Galatians 3 verse 10. The wages of sin, says the Apostle Paul, is death. And if we're not trusting in Jesus, we will have to spend eternity paying for all the ways in which we did not image him. But the good news of the gospel is that God so loved the world, the world which is filled with people who struggle to bear his image, that he sent his son to live a perfect life and to die a cursed death. Jesus was willing to leave the glory of heaven and come down into this world and take on the likeness of man and the limitations that come with that and go to the cross as the sinless one, the one who perfectly bore the image of God. And he did that because he loves us. He doesn't do this for animals. He does this for people because he loves us. He created us in his image and wants to restore us. So if you repent and trust in Jesus, then he forgives you of all your sin. He washes you clean such that you are like Naaman whose leprous leprous flat flesh was restored like that of a little child. And he works by his word and by his spirit to transform you into his image with ever-increasing glory. That's the good news of the gospel. Just as through the first Adam, sin came into the world, so through the second Adam, salvation must come into the world. And Jesus did just that. And when he returns, he promises us that he's going to raise us with bodies that are like his glorious body, hearts and wills that are like his glorious heart and will. That's your destiny as a Christian, if you are a follower of Jesus. 
Romans 8, 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Or as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 29, as we have borne the image of the man of dust, so when Jesus returns, we shall bear the image of the heavenly man. What a glorious hope we have that one day we who struggle to bear God's image will fully be able to do so and eternally be able to do so. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we confess that we struggle to bear your image insofar as we struggle to live according to your law, which is a reflection of you yourself. And we confess, Father, that we know that the verdict we have is guilty, the judgment is eternal death, but how we thank you that you so loved the world, you so loved the human race, that you sent your son Jesus to live a perfect life which imaged the Father in every way. And you call us to come to the cross, confess our sin, and be forgiven of the penalty of our sin, and have true righteousness given to us. And thank you that you sent your spirit also to dwell in our hearts and through all that goes on in our lives that you progressively make us more and more according to your image. So mold us, make us, and shape us that we would be more and more like Christ and that we would show Christ to the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.